out of all the things that have happened in 2020, it seems like one of the few good aspects is that people have found the time to get into new hobbies. I know I have. And while I was getting into these new hobbies, I remembered just how overwhelming it can be. For example, just last week I got into an airplane cockpit for the very first time. I'm working on getting my pilot's license. And there were so many buttons and switches and dials and things to keep track of that I was immediately overwhelmed. And I thought, how am I ever going to do this? And that reminded me of a couple years ago when I got in astrophotography. There's just so many different little things to learn. You're not sure what gear to buy and whether that's going to be a good investment or not. So what I've decided to do is create a YouTube course here that's going to ease you into astrophotography because I know there's millions of new people gaining into this hobby. And my goal with these series of videos is to show you exactly what you need to get started without breaking the bank, how to go out and take your photos for the best results, and how to process your images. But there's a lot we're going to cover over these next few videos. Let's start off though and talk about what gear you actually need to buy. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that I will have links for everything in the video description below. That way you can verify you are looking at the correct products and stay organized. These are not affiliate links though, so I don't care if you use them or not. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to make your life a little bit easier. The first thing you'll need for astrophotography is a camera of some sort. This is going to be the foundation of your entire setup. So you want to make sure you're picking a good camera for the job. You've got a lot of different choices though. You can go with a mirrorless camera, a traditional DSLR, or maybe even a high-end dedicated astro camera like you see here. I've already gone through and created a free course here on YouTube that'll explain everything you need to know about these types of cameras, including how to use them, how to set them up, and how to edit the photos. But if you're just getting into this hobby, you probably don't want to go down this route. Even though these cameras are specifically designed for astrophotography, it's a much steeper learning curve and you might get discouraged along the way. So to keep things simple, I recommend you start off with a DSLR or mirrorless camera and chances are you already have one. That's one of the great things about astrophotography nowadays is that using the camera gear you might already have, you can still get fantastic results. The first thing I want to stress is that you don't need to go out and spend $4,000 or $1,500 or whatever it is on a new camera. If you already have a DSLR and telephoto lens, you can utilize that equipment when you're first getting started. Now maybe a couple of months from now, after you've got some practice and you actually know what you're doing, you might start to notice some sensor problems or that your lens isn't very sharp, and then you might want to invest in some of this gear I'm going to be talking about. But until then, if you're really just getting into this, I know one of the worst parts of getting a new hobby is that there's just so many upfront costs. And this is one area where you can wait a couple months before spending any money. As long as you have a mount of some sort, a DSLR, and a telephoto lens, you can do astrophotography. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about some of my recommended cameras. And again, I want to mention that these are not going to be cheap, but they're going to work really well. And therefore, if you do need to upgrade or decide you want to invest, these are my recommended options. And because there are so many cameras to choose from, I'm not going to waste an hour of your day talking about all the differences. I'm just going to recommend a few cameras that I personally know will work well and maybe tell you some things to stay away from. Let's start off and talk about the three major brands you can choose from. There's Canon, Sony, and then Nikon. It seems a lot of people are either on Canon or Sony for astrophotography. And I think that's just because a handful of people online that have prominent websites or YouTube channels use Canon or Sony, and that's why people tend to gravitate towards them. Me, I'm kind of the odd man out. I use Nikon cameras, and I find that they give really good results, and more importantly, repeatable and reliable results. I'm using right now the Nikon D780. So for anybody on Nikon, this is what I recommend you get if you're looking to upgrade your camera or get a new one, especially for astrophotography. The D780 has a few really nice features. The first is the camera sensor itself. You're going to get really good, clean images, even in low light scenarios, and you won't have any sensor problems to deal with along the way, which is one of the big problems with a lot of the Canon cameras out there. Another great feature of the Nikon D780 is the extended shutter speed options, where you can go past 30 seconds very quickly. You can do 60, 90, 120, 240, all the way up to 900 seconds just by flicking the switch back here. And unfortunately, almost every other camera on the market, regardless of the manufacturer, is limited to just 30 seconds. If you want to shoot an exposure longer than 30 seconds, you have to go out and buy an external remote. Remember to bring that remote with you, make sure it has batteries, plug it in, and configure the remote and the camera to work properly. And that's kind of a hassle. So with the Nikon D780, again, you just enable extended shutter speeds, and now you can quickly take your 
maybe 15 second long test photo, and then scroll over to taking your four minute long real photo. And this sounds like a small little change, but I guarantee you it's gonna make your night a lot easier. Again, for those on Nikon, I recommend the D780 if you're looking for a new camera. This will definitely give you great results. Let's move on to Canon next. I was kind of harsh on Canon, but I just call it like I see it, and I think a lot of their cameras have serious problems, frankly. Not to say all of them do. There's a lot of great cameras from Canon, and one camera I highly recommend from Canon is their EOS R. Every time I've worked with somebody who had this camera, it always gave clean, reliable results with no sensor problems whatsoever. This is also a mirrorless camera, so it's small, it's portable, and lightweight. And for those of you on Canon, if you're looking to upgrade your body, the EOS R is a fantastic choice, and it's also not terribly expensive. Another option for Canon shooters is the EOS RA. This is their astrophotography specific camera. Although to be honest, I really didn't notice that much of a change at all. I've worked with a handful of students who had this camera, and when we were taking our images at night, I really couldn't tell the difference between the RA and just the standard R or any other DSLR for that matter. So I don't really know if they're just overselling what they've done with the sensor, but it's still a good camera. It'll give you great results. I just think they've kind of overhyped it and you're not really seeing that much of a difference as you would expect to see. So if you are trying to save some money, don't worry about getting the RA model. You might as well save yourself a thousand dollars and just get the EOS R. Like I said, that's going to give really nice results and save you a thousand bucks. And those are the two Canon cameras I recommend. As I mentioned, a lot of their Rebel series and even their 5D series, like the 5D Mark IV and Mark III, tend to be very unreliable, where you could have five of the exact same camera models lined up side by side under the same exact conditions, the same exact camera settings, and they might perform completely differently. And that's a big problem because you might see a review that says it's a great camera, you get yours, and you get terrible results. And that's probably one of the most frustrating things I've had to see with people is that they do everything correctly in the camera. They have the right camera settings. They take all their calibration frames. They have a good star tracker. But no matter what they do, because their camera sensor is just not up to the challenge of astrophotography, they're never getting the photos they want. And that's why I tell them if I encounter that, just buy yourself a new camera and all these problems are going to go away if you get a good camera. And that will make things a lot easier for you moving forward. Finally, for those on Sony, you've got a lot of choices on Sony. They've got pretty much all the mirrorless cameras nowadays. One thing I tell you to research on your own though is the Star Eater Bug. This is a problem that they had a couple years ago. I don't really think it's um, as much of a problem anymore, but the onboard software would think that all the stars in your photos were artifacts from your camera sensor and it would try and remove them even on the raw photos. And this caused a big uproar I think they've since fixed most of those problems, but that would be one of the reasons you might want to stay away from Sony is because they do some weird stuff to the raw photos on occasion. However, I've worked with a lot of students who get great results from their Sony cameras. The only thing I'd caution you if you are getting a Sony camera, don't get the really high resolution ones necessarily because that's going to take up a lot of camera space and hard drive space and you're very quickly going to run into some space issues unless you have a lot of hard drives. So I usually recommend a camera sensor around 24 megapixels to 36 megapixels. That tends to give the best results without breaking the bank and your memory cards. All right, so we talked about the different camera models. I really don't want to spend any more time on this because there are so many choices. But like I said, we looked at Canon, Sony, and Nikon. I personally recommend Nikon brand of cameras that give you the most reliable and clean results if you get a good one like the Nikon D780. If you're on Canon though, go for that EOS R. That's going to be a fantastic option. And then Sony, I don't have as much experience with them, but generally any of their new ones should work fine. Once you've gotten your camera figured out, then you need to consider what lens you want. And for this, as usual, you've got a lot of choices. If you're mainly interested in deep space astrophotography, then you'll want to get a lens that has a minimum of 200 millimeters, because what you'll find is that 200 millimeters or less is just not enough zoom for most of the nebula and galaxies, and they're gonna be fairly small in the frame, and your final image is gonna lack that wow factor. That's why I tend to recommend something like a 150 to 600 millimeter lens, a 200 to 500, maybe even a 100 to 400. These are all great ranges, and the best part is you can use these for astrophotography, wildlife, landscapes, and maybe even portraits. For the past few years, I've been using the Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter lens, and this has done a really nice job. 
It's got a lot of zoom. It's fairly lightweight compared to some of the other options. And it's just over a thousand dollars. Like I said, this is a great lens because it is so versatile and maybe it's a cloudy night. Well, I can still go out and do wildlife photography the next day compared to a telescope, which is only good for one thing. For those of you who are looking for a good lens, I recommend the Tamron 150 to 600. One of the th nice features though is they came out with a G2 version in the last few years. This has a few notable upgrades from my original version of the lens. One of them is that the zoom ring here can actually push outwards and that means it locks in and that prevents the lens from slipping if you're aiming up at a high angle. The tripod collar also has an Arca Swiss plate built in so you can quickly attach it to your ball head and it has a few more vibration control methods that work a little bit better for those daytime action shots. If you don't want to go with the Tamron, then of course you have the first party brands like Canon and Nikon, but those are going to cost you a lot more as well. And they might not really do that much better for astrophotography, frankly. There's also the Sigma versions, but those are generally more heavy than the Tamron. And weight is a big factor because the more weight you have, ultimately the worse results you're generally going to get. So you do want to find a lighter lens whenever possible. Okay, we talked about lenses, but there's also, of course, telescopes. A lot of people think you need a telescope for astrophotography, and that's not true at all. As you've seen in this video, most of the photos were taken with a standard camera lens. However, I do also use a William Optics Red Cat telescope. It basically looks like a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, if you're familiar with those. This is fairly cheap compared to a lens that would cost $1,200, if not $1,500 or more. It's lightweight and very compact. However, it's not really that versatile. I can't use it during the day necessarily. There's no autofocus or anything like that. And the images themselves, they're sharp and crisp. There's not really any vignette to speak of. That's a big deal. But in general, for most people, I recommend going with a camera lens just because if you have a DSLR or mirrorless camera, you're going to get much more use out of a camera lens than a telescope. If you do want to get a telescope though, again, I do have the RedCat 250 millimeter telescope, and that does a fine job. The only problem here, again, is that that focal length is 250 millimeters. That's kind of short. Like I said, I'd rather have 300, 400, 500 millimeters, somewhere in that range. And that's really the only downside of this particular telescope is that it is kind of short and you might not get that wow factor out of your images. Moving along, uh, William Optics, they do make some pretty good scopes along with a few other manufacturers. The only thing I'll mention before we continue is that you don't want to go out and buy a big heavy telescope necessarily because that would mean you have to buy a big expensive amount to go along with it. So for most of us, like I said, you can stick with a telephoto lens to start off with and get great results. And then maybe after you've gotten enough experience and you know what's going on, then you might want to upgrade to a specialized telescope that might give you a little bit better results and help with some more added features like a Batonov mask and a guide scope plate. But that's another video for another day. Before we move on to the next topic, I wanted to briefly cover your camera's sensor size and how that will impact your astro images. I've already gone through and created this full length article on my website, link will be in the description, and this will cover everything you need to know in a lot of detail. It's another long one, so be prepared for that. The short version is that if you're going to be buying a new DSLR, you generally have two choices. You can get a full frame camera or a crop sensor, which is APS-C, and you see that right here. The full frame camera has a larger surface area, as you can see. That means there's more space to capture light, and that generally translates to cleaner images when we're shooting at night. However, the full frame cameras are usually a lot more expensive and the lenses for them are equally as expensive. So for that reason, if you're on a tight budget, you might want to stick with an APS size C. You can usually find these cameras for $600 or less. The images themselves will generally have more grain in them. And that means you have to take more photos to overcome those problems and ultimately use longer shutter speeds and things like that. So this will require more work, but it'll save you some money. And one benefit of using an APS-C size camera is that because the sensor is physically smaller than the full frame, you actually get a bit of magnification. That means if you're using a relatively short lens, like a 250 millimeter red cat, which we looked at earlier, you're going to get a small boost in the zoom. This is a very technical concept though, and I don't want to mislead you. So like I said, if you read the article, that will explain what I'm talking about. And finally, for those looking to get a dedicated astro camera, which I mentioned briefly at the start of the video, generally those sensors will be micro four thirds or one inch. These are much smaller than a full frame camera. And one of the nice things with these small sensors on the dedicated astro cameras 
is that I could take that same William Optics Red Cat telescope, which only has 250 millimeters, but when I pair it with a small Micro Four Thirds sensor, I'm effectively getting 500 millimeter focal length equivalent. And that allows me to fill the frame with a small compact telescope. That's one of the benefits of going down the dedicated astro camera route. Anyway, I just wanted you to be aware that your camera sensor size will have an impact on your astrophotography images. We don't have time to really get into all this today. For more information, again, check out this article on my website. Now that we've covered cameras and lenses, let's move on to your mount. This is gonna be the true foundation of your entire setup and what's gonna allow you to shoot longer exposures without star trails. But if you make the wrong choice here, it's really gonna cause you a lot of problems. So I wanna make sure I'm very clear. What you're looking for for astrophotography is an equatorial mount. These are specifically designed to move your camera with the speed and the rotation of the stars. That way you can do astrophotography. So whenever you're looking into mounts, make sure it says equatorial. It might also say German equatorial, same thing. What you don't wanna buy for astrophotography are these alt as mounts and they all tend to look the same they have this like curved arm that's attached to the telescope the alt as mounts kind of move like a stair step pattern up and over up and over up and over and they don't account for the rotation of the objects in the night sky in other words alt as mounts are great for visual observing but not for astrophotography so if you have one of these mounts lying around the house you don't want to use it necessarily you might want to mess around with it a little bit but for real astrophotography we want an equatorial mount of some sort. And from here, it really just comes down to your budget. You don't have to spend $6,000 on a mount. You also don't necessarily want to spend $200 on a mount because chances are the internals are not that well built and you're not really going to be able to shoot very long before you get star trails. For most people, if you want to get a good mount, you're looking at $600 to $2,000. That'd be the low on the high end. For example, one mount that I'm personally looking at, if I eventually move up to this, would be like the iOptron. Again, I still have to do a lot of research. This would be a good time to mention that I don't actually use one of these big go-to mounts yet. So for more information, you want to check out Chuck's Astrophotography, Astro Backyard, or Dylan O'Donnell here on YouTube. They all use these mounts every single night, and they'll be able to give you a lot more information than I can. What I'm using, and what I've really come to be successful with, is a small portable star tracker. These don't have some of the nice features as those big mounts we were just looking at, but the plus side is they're usually a lot cheaper and they're very portable and lightweight. So for those of you who like to do a lot of traveling, this is the perfect option. And every single photo you've seen in this video and on my website, were all taken with the simple SkyGuider Pro for the most part. And that's usually the star tracker that I recommend. If you're just getting in this hobby and you don't wanna get a big mount, especially if you're doing a lot of traveling like you see here, then go to B&H, type in Star Tracker, or use the links in the video description, and look at some of the options here. We've got the Sky Guider Pro, we've got the Star Adventure, there's a Polari, there's a Sky Tracker Pro, there's a Move Shoot Move, there's so many different options, it gets very overwhelming. And for that, I'd recommend you read this article on my website, which Star Tracker should I get? Again, link will be included. I've gone through here and pretty much written a book that'll tell you everything you need to know. It goes on and on and on. So I recommend you read through that. I've also got a YouTube video that's linked here if you just wanna watch it and not have to read so much. What it comes down to though, for most people for doing deep space astrophotography, you have two choices as far as I'm concerned. That's the Skyguider Pro and the Star Adventure. They both do the same thing. They're just a slightly different design from two different companies. I personally prefer the Skyguider Pro. I think it's a little bit easier to use and doesn't have as much cheap plastic crap all over it like the Star Adventure does. There is an important distinction though for the Sky Guider Pro here. It comes in two different versions now. The Polar Scope version for $428, that's the one I have and it works fine. There's also the new iPolar version, which costs way more and actually performs way worse in a lot of cases. The problem I have with this iPolar is that there's a little camera inside of here rather than a Polar Scope. And that means if you want to do a rough alignment visually, you can't because there's a, a camera here. Whereas on the original version, well, it doesn't really show you, but there's a little polar scope built in there. So you can actually look through there and find the North Star. And for me, that's a much easier and simpler way to do things. I've also had a lot of problems with the iPolar software on my laptop. Therefore, I highly recommend you avoid the iPolar version of the SkyGuider Pro more than likely it's gonna cause you a lot of problems and you'd be better off saving your money 
and some headaches and just getting the original version with the built-in polar scope, not the eye polar. So that's the tracker I personally use and I've gotten great results with. That's the Sky Guider Pro. This is good for both Milky Way and deep space astrophotography. Some people though prefer the Star Adventure. That one works fine too. Although, like I said, I don't really like it as much as the Sky Guider Pro. It's big, it's bulky, it's heavy. It's just not very graceful, but it gets the job done. And it's a little bit cheaper if you get the right package. Either way, I recommend you do some more research on your own. And most importantly, read this article I wrote that will get you up to speed on these different star trackers. The only thing left to talk about are tripods. This is going to be, of course, the foundation of your whole setup. So you want to make sure you get a solid tripod. One of the big problems I see when people are first getting started is that if they do have a camera and lens lying around, they might also have some cheap tripod kind of like this, where it's very flimsy. It's got this kind of lame panning head. This is not what you want to get started. This most likely will eventually break or fall over and destroy your camera gear. You need a really sturdy base. And with that in mind, you've got a lot of choices. For those who are going to be using a star tracker of some sort, like the two we talked about earlier, the Star Adventure or the Sky Guider Pro, you have the ability to get those with their own custom tripods. They're not very expensive. They're not really that great either. And they're not very versatile. You're only going to be using this with your star tracker for astrophotography. So for that reason, they work okay, but personally, if I'm going to spend money on a tripod, I'd rather get a nice one. And that's why I spent the money and got a Faisal CT3442. This is the tripod I personally use. It does a good job. There's definitely better options out there. There's also cheaper options out there, but be expecting to pay at least $200 for a halfway decent tripod. You'll notice too that this one doesn't have a ball head or anything. It's just a pair of legs with a little screw at the top. This is where you're ultimately going to attach your star tracker to, and that'll give you a nice secure connection. And the reason I like this tripod in particular is because there is no center column. If you have a tripod with a center column that rises up and down, that's going to be a big source of instability when you're using a star tracker. And that's caused me no end of headaches over the last few years. So I highly recommend if you are looking to get a new tripod, you make sure you find one that does not have a center column. Just to show you, here is an example of a tripod with a center column, and this is what you want to avoid because this thing will shift slightly left and right, and that's really going to mess you up at night. We need to be super precise, and you just can't do it with most of these uh, sliding heads like that. This would be another topic where I'd say you might want to do your own research, come to your own conclusions on getting a tripod. I'm using the Faisal, though. This is a good brand. They make good tripods that aren't overly expensive, Although if you're just getting into this, $400 is a lot of money for sure. And for those of you who are going to be using the bigger go-to mounts, you need to be careful when you're buying your mount because you might inadvertently buy the wrong thing. For example, we have two Celestron models right here, one for about $3,000, one for $3,600. And if we look closely, this one does not come with a tripod. And usually they're pretty thorough about saying, hey, this doesn't come with one. So if you make that mistake, you'll have to buy one separately. You're better off when you buy your mount. Make sure it does have the tripod included. And these will work fine. Again, if you're getting a big go-to mount, try and find one that comes with the tripod. But if you're using a smaller star tracker like I am, then you'll usually want to go out and buy your own type of tripod. And I recommend Faisal, but there's a lot of options out there. So don't feel like you have to get this one in particular. And it's just what I use. The next thing I want to talk about are light pollution filters, because one of the unfortunate realities of astrophotography is that almost everybody is dealing with some level of light pollution, and this extra light in the sky is going to wash out most of the nebula and galaxies. That means less contrast, less detail, and more work in post-processing to get a halfway decent photo. The way these light pollution filters work, as you'll read in my article here, link will be in the description, basically the filters are designed to block out street lamps and other sources of light pollution while allowing light from nebula and galaxies to come through and that gives you more contrast and overall better looking photos now based on my tests for example we have a photo here taken in la kind of a traditional scene where you have a lot of light pollution and this kind of warm color cast when i added in this case the uhc filter from optolong it drastically darkened the image and also really radically changed the white balance 
If you look closely too, you'll notice that the street lights have become really distorted. That's a problem with clip and filters that I'll mention in this article if you want to read through it. Uh, let's take another look though at some photos of the nebula. And here we have a photo of the North American nebula with no filter whatsoever. You can vaguely make it out, but it's kind of hard to see. After I had the L Pro filter from Optolong, it looked a lot better. And the edits applied were the exact same. So do you really see how well these filters can work at bringing out the nebula and suppressing some of that background light. Unfortunately though, some of these light pollution filters will cause very heavy color casts, and that's what we see here. No filter versus a UHC, again from Optolong. And this really brought out the nebula nicely and suppressed some of that light pollution, but the overall color cast is gonna be very hard to remove, especially if you're just getting into this and you're not very comfortable with Photoshop or PixInsight or anything else. And that's one reason I usually tell people don't necessarily run out and buy a light pollution filter just yet. See what you can do with your current situation, and if it's just too much light from the city, then you might want to think about getting one of these filters. And I think I've mentioned I'm usually out in the middle of nowhere, so light pollution is not a concern for me most of the time. Therefore, I have very limited experience with light pollution filters. And that's why I'd recommend you do your own research on this topic. There's a lot of other astrophotographers that use these much more frequently than me and will be able to give you more insight. But if you want to head over to my website, read this article, that at least gets you up to speed and then you can move on from there and decide what you want to do. And that about does it for the gear section of this video. Just to recap, all you really need are a simple DSLR, whether that's Canon, Nikon, or Sony. Once you got your DSLR or mirrorless camera, then you need a lens, at least 200 millimeters, maybe something like the Tamron 150 to 600. If you've got both of those, then you need something that will control everything and move it around in the night sky. You can go with a big equatorial mount like you see here. These are gonna be big and heavy, but they will have some nice features like go-to functionality if you get the right one. And that means you can type in Orion and will automatically move your camera directly to Orion and you can start shooting. That's a very important feature. Whereas these smaller star trackers like you see here, the Star Adventure, and the Skyguider Pro, and all these other ones, they do not have a go-to function, and that means you have to find all the objects manually. That can be a bit of a challenge, but if you wanna learn how to do that, I do have what's called my Deep Space course. There's 20 plus hours of videos in there that will actually teach you how to find these objects just using the stars overhead and a little bit of pointers along the way, and I'd recommend you check that out for more information. The final thing you'll need to get started in your astrophotography adventure is some type of post-processing software. This is what's going to turn those kind of boring, ugly, raw photos into a beautiful final image. And for that, I'd recommend going with Adobe Photoshop. You can get a bundle here, which is their photography plan for $10 a month. That's going to get you Lightroom, Photoshop, Bridge, and Camera Raw. Those are really the main applications you're going to need. You also need some free stacking software, and we'll cover that in another video here in this course. However, you could go the more advanced route where you get an application called PixInsight, but to be honest, that was overwhelming even for me, and I've been doing Astro for years. So if you're just the average person getting started, I recommend sticking with a much widely known application called Photoshop. You're going to find a lot of tutorials out there, so this will make it easier to get into. And once you get the hang of the interface, it's not too hard to do. I've also got a full Astro post-processing course that'll teach you everything you need to know about processing your images, again using the photography bundle here from Adobe. I know some people hate the $10 a month thing though, they don't want to pay monthly for software, I get it. Unfortunately though, some of the other applications you can go with like Affinity Photo or GIMP, I think GIMP is free but Affinity Photo costs some money, they're just hard to translate some of the techniques we're going to be doing and there's not as many videos out there. And really, you're just gonna be causing yourself more problems down the road. So I'd recommend buying the bullet, paying 10 bucks a month. You can always stop it whenever you want, but that's really gonna give you the best path to success. And that's all I've got for you today. We covered cameras, lenses, telescopes, mounts, software, and more. And in the following video, we'll actually go out there on location. I'll show you how all the stuff works together. And then we'll even do a video on post-processing so you can see how simple it actually is. If you want to learn more, of course, I've got a lot of videos here on YouTube you can check out that go into a lot more detail than I can in just a few videos in this course. I've also got full courses available on my website. Those each have 15 to 20 hours, if not more, of content. They're very thorough, and they're really designed for the average person trying to get into astrophotography. 
I'm going to cover all the little questions you're going to have along the way. I even include some of my own images so you can practice along with the post processing. So there's a lot of great content there. You can find that all over on my website. But that's all I got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.